May I, uh, Mr. Vice President, Your Excellency, um, once again wish you a very happy birthday. And uh, it's, I'm touched, and I'm sure we are all touched, uh, by the fact that you took the time of a very special day like this, away from the family, to do this for us. So I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Osage <laughs> Ford Chairman, Your Excellency the Vice President, Honorable Minister, Honorable Ministers, <clears throat> Honorable Ministers, um, Honorable Members of Parliament, Management of uh, the Mobile Phone Companies Board, Executives, Board Members. Um, it's a great pleasure to have you join us this morning. A few years ago, when my son was just uh, four or five years old, his aunt sent him a present at Christmas. And my wife asked him to write her a letter to say thank you. He looked up at her rather strangely and said, why? We can just send her a text. <laughs> and he was right, because times have changed. And early this year, I went to speak to a group of university undergraduates. And I asked them when they last went to the post office to post a letter. None of them could recall. And I thought, wow, how times have changed. And the times have indeed changed because in 1984, thereabouts, as a young journalist, I went to interview uh, uh, Madame Fathia Nkrumah uh, as she was preparing to leave Ghana. And then I asked after Samia, her daughter. I was told she had gone all the way to McCarthy Hill, to the home of the wealthy Dr. Akable Miza, to make an international phone call. <laughs> Times have changed. I recall the commissioning ceremony in 1980 of the Earth Satellite Station by President Hila Liman at Kuntunse near Nsawam. Dr. Liman placed the first direct international phone call via satellite to the UK, and it was a national event. <laughs> it was broadcast live on national television. How times have changed. Only a little over a decade ago, people bought SIM cards for 2 million CDs. 200 Ghana CDs today. Today, the price of a phone chip is not very different from that of a potato chip. <laughs> One chip. The times have changed. Today, Haji Afati, the bulk yam seller at Agbogoloshi Market, doesn't have to get on the truck to make the 16-hour journey to Salaga to place her order. She simply places a call to the supplier from her mobile phone. She checks the price on Isoko on her mobile phone. She makes the payment using your mobile phone, mobile money, or one of the other applications. And the truck driver calls to say when he's arrived. Consider what that means for efficiency, for the profitability of her business, and her availability to her family. The times have changed. Today, your handset my handset, our handset, make the difference between life and death for a pregnant woman on the verge of a complicated delivery in a remote village. All it takes is a phone call or a text message to the taxi driver in the nearby town. And I have no doubt that one can establish a correlation between mobile phone access and the recently reported steady decline in maternal mortality. Students and researchers and teachers and journalists 
have access to research materials and books at their fingertips. They just have to know how to spell Google. <laughs> the openness of our elections, the transparency of our political system, the stability of our republic, the things we take for granted are in due part, a very great part, to the ability of citizens to participate in it, to call or text into live radio and contribute to the conduct of polls and subsequently to national conversations. Today we feel exposed, naked even, if we leave home without our phones. Mobile phones have become our second breath, a bridge to life. Mobile and broadband technology have contracted time, compacted space, and is delivering information and news and knowledge on the go. Osage for chairman, ladies and gentlemen, these giant leaps, these immense benefits of mobile technology have not accrued to us in Ghana as a matter of course. They haven't happened because we are nice or because the Meridian Line runs through Yendi or because nature owes it to us. Nor are they part of the aftershocks of the Big Bang. Things and times have changed and delivered these direct and intravenous benefits to citizens because the right policy and regulatory environment was deliberately crafted to attract mobile phone companies and capital. The policy and regulatory environment was fashioned to court mobile phone companies and capital like a man courts a bride. And now we've ended up in a polygamous situation. <laughs> Six brides, each bearing all, for ultimate attention. As a result, mobile phone companies have invested over five billion US dollars in Ghana since the mid-90s. Mobile phone companies currently employ directly and indirectly over one and a half million people, our people, from high-end engineering, finance, legal, and marketing professionals, through copywriters, creative people in the advertising industry, and welders bolting together outdoor billboards to itinerant youths selling top-up cards in the streets of our cities or under the shade trees of our towns and villages, and all the vendors in the links in between that constitute the supply chain. Today, nearly 38% of all the revenues of mobile phone companies goes to the government. 10% of all government income comes from mobile phone companies. Last year, telecoms directly accounted for 7% of capital investment in Ghana, and telecoms was responsible for a third of GDP growth in 2010. At the same time, the cost of mobile communications in Ghana remains one of the lowest in the world. And year-on-year -year inflation, July 2011 figures, in telecommunications is or was zero compared to 23% in transport, 6% in housing and utilities, 8% for health, 3.25% for food. In my lifetime and in yours, there is no product or service which has experienced the cumulative decline in price that we've seen in mobile phone tariffs, not for water, not for education, not for petrol or housing or personal costs, not for even the humble gari. And this is in spite of rising costs of our inputs. Only days ago, the vice president cut the sod for the construction of a 12-story head office 
costing almost 30 million Ghana CDs for the National Communications Authority. The NCA is funded, not exclusively, but largely from the fees derived from mobile operators. GIFEC, the Universal Fund, is also helping to fund a 36 million Ghana City National Data Center. GIFEC itself is funded by mobile operators, each of whom contributes 1% of their revenues. The Chamber is happy that our members are making such a difference for the NCA and important national institutions. However, the obvious gains of this industry and contribution to the economy and to ordinary people, notwithstanding that policy environment that has served us so well, that regulatory shepherding that has been delivering these benefits to our people, the equilibrium in that ecosystem is starting to be disturbed. The mood music is increasingly discordant. Do you, one would presume to questions of a quality of service. And so I come to the rich subject of poor service. What the mobile for operators are signed on to, you see, is a set of quality of service parameters or thresholds which, if maintained, will enable us to deliver the same standards of service as those of the first world. Sweden, Switzerland, Denmark, Canada, Japan, UK, and so on. Ghanaians, too, deserve the very best in services. Over that, there is no question. Ghana would be a great first world country, indeed, if all of us private and public institutions, agencies and services, if all would be as bold to sign up to the first world standards demanded from our industry and accept to pay penalties should they fail. But, Mr. Chairman, or Nana Chairman, there are external factors peculiar to our third world environment and over which all of our institutions and this industry have little or no control over, and yet which impact the quality of service, factors that you would not find in the first world. One of them is cable cuts and thefts. Since the beginning of this year alone, mobile operators have suffered, <coughs> excuse me, since the beginning of this year alone, mobile phone operators have suffered over 400 cable cuts. Many of these are due to road construction. Some are due to thefts and sometimes even to bushfires. The, this prevents access to the networks. The financial implications are horrendous. It costs affected operators around 140,000 US dollars every month to repair damaged cables. Then there's the revenue losses to operators and government due to the inability of subscribers to access the network. Then there is, above all, the damage to the reputation of operators by justifiably furious subscribers. Increasingly, operators are avoiding multiple trenching by sharing their trenches to minimize cost, but more importantly, reduce public hazard. That, however, also means that when there is a cut, more than one operator is affected. In Sweden or Canada, it is unlikely that citizens would steal telecom cables to make bracelets, or build kiosks and shops on the road reservation and block the deployment of telecoms and other utility infrastructure. The communications minister indicated recently that he will set up a panel to address this problem. We are happy to hear that and we would encourage him to treat this matter with 
first world dispatch and efficiency. Power outages and diesel thefts also prevent base stations from functioning without undue interruption. It is extremely unlikely that you run into a man on the M1 in the UK or along the Autobahn in, uh, near Berlin trying to pedal diesel by the gallon to passing motorists. The resistance of some suburbs to the sighting of towers in their communities due to fear that electromagnetic emissions would affect their health also contributes to gaps in the coverage areas as does poor spatial planning. For the records, emissions from towers are non-ionizing, which means they would not cause cancer. They pose no greater threat than emissions from your television set, or your light bulb, or remote car control. Even so, operators are not taking public concerns for granted. Increasingly, operators are co-locating, sharing towers, not only because of cost, but also because it is greener, and it enhances the aesthetic effect of the physical environment. Of course, in the first world, where there are many high-rise buildings, operators simply attach the antenna to them. It's, it's actually the preferred option. It's cheaper. Chairman, one of the longest running problems that is hurting telecoms companies are the costs and the hurdles in deploying infrastructure and the complete absence of predictability in how our local authorities determine business operating permits when it comes to mobile phone companies. Examples. In one district, the annual business operating permit for insurance companies is 200 Ghana cities. For commercial banks, 700. ECG, 1,000. Mobile phone companies, 9,000. 9,000. In one district in 2009, the business operating permit for a large industry and mobile phone operators as well was 2,000 Ghana cities. The following year, whilst the other remained the same, that of mobile phone operators was increased to a total of 22,500. And this is just one district. Just a couple of weeks ago, one operator paid almost 400,000 US dollars to Ghana Highways Authority, which has the authority, for a permit to lay a fiber optic cable. The cable runs for around 400 kilometers or so. Each district assembly is, in addition, charging for the cable running through their towns. One district had, or has ordered the operator to pay an extra 420,000 Ghana cities and has stopped the operator from carrying out the job. Do we want the mobile phone services in our communities or not? Do we want improvements in the quality of service or not? How do you expand broadband internet access and enhance quality if we obstruct the very infrastructure that delivers it? If we dissuade and hurt and punish the companies that want to deploy them. How? This is not the tobacco industry. Don't we realize that this industry is a direct and visible enabler of economic and social activity and outcomes? If this strange principle makes sense, then let us apply it across board. Ghana Water Company. You want to lay a pipe through the district? Give us all the money up front. ECG, you want to um, improve um, you know, electricity supply in the community? We will milk you to death. In Kenya, the Ministry of Local Government and the regulator was confronted. This doesn't just happen in Ghana alone. In Kenya, they were also confronted with a similar phenomenon. But the ministry and the regulator put out a clear directive stating the following, quote, 
while local authorities in principle may levy charges for telephone masts, electricity pylons, water supply pipes, or other such infrastructure, the charging of fees must be minimal, if made at all, as they are inconsistent with government policies of fostering economic growth and access to affordable services." Unquote. In August, operators were told that this matter would be addressed. Mr. Chairman, till date, there is an import duty of 20% on SIM cards based on the 2010 copyright legislation that claims that the phone chip is a device for the storage of copyright material, much in the same category as CD-ROMs, memory cards, and CDs. But your chip is not even capable of storing your own contacts. Who stores music or downloads a book onto their SIM card? A request, a kind, humble request for a review is currently on the communication minister's desk. And we believe that it is receiving first world attention <laughs> and action. <laughs> Fundamentally, the industry is concerned about a posture that the African Mobile Observatory 2011 report just released warns against. The report says, and this is a quote, some of the more developed countries in Africa, such as Nigeria, Tunisia, Ghana, and to a lesser extent Kenya, were shown to adopt revenue maximization approaches rather than driving uptake. Countries with tax maximization policies should examine their approach to make sure that they are not hampering overarching development goals, unquote. The revenue maximization reflex stems from the belief that the mobile industry is awash in cash and without much sweat. I have an old friend, Kofio Pariado, who used to say, it looks easy when Beckham bends the ball. You two, go and try. Even if we assumed that to be true, we would be making a grave error by comparing the return on investment in mobile telecoms to that of, say, aquaculture or textile manufacturing or leatherworks. Two reasons. One, the barriers to entry in mobile telecommunications are not cheap. They are steep. Apart from a GSM license, which alone will set you back $50 million, you should be ready to spend half a billion, perhaps, before you've sold a single chip or earned a cent in this exceedingly competitive mobile playground. You don't require that sort of capital to import flip-flops from China. Second, we, you must com compare the return on investment in telecoms in Ghana to the same industry elsewhere in the world, where there might be greater, uh, where they might generate a greater bang for each buck. Again, the African Telecoms Observatory report cautions, and this is again a quote, uncertainty in the regulatory regime and lack of a clear long-term path for the industry's development increases the risk profile and can worsen the overall investment climate. Regulatory policy should be based on sound and efficient legal system that enables timely contract enforcement, adequate appeal processes, and effective implementation." Unquote. On our part as a chamber of mobile operators, we take the recent expressions, Nana Chairman, of anger about quality of service seriously. We'll keep an open mind 
and an open door to work with institutions, agencies, and decision makers to solve problems and strive to build a world-class industry. I will not dwell on our surmountable family disagreements with the NCA or the ministry over technical measurements because I believe we will find common ground because we must. The teeth and the tongue have no alternative but to accept to be housed, co-located <laughs> inside the same little enclosure. Where there is conflict between industry and any institution, we expect due process, not self-help, to guide us towards a resolution. There is a Nigerian proverb that I am very fond of. It says, no matter how hot your anger is, it will not cook the yam. <laughs> A gentleman phoned into a radio interview the other day and suggested that if the environment is that unattractive, operators should pack and leave. See, the problem is if they did leave, we will have to go after them. We will have to go on investment roadshows to bring them or others back because we need the infrastructure. We need the technology. It is fundamental to our economic development and growth. 1% of mobile penetration spurs economic growth by, sorry, 10% of mobile penetration spurs economic growth by 1%. If the underlying problems do not change, we will be back in a few years where we are today, even if all the penalties are paid. You see, popular anger has never been never will be an alternative to the boring but time-tested chore of cold, calculated, dispassionate, and deliberate policy formulation, painstakingly and grindingly implemented to achieve clear goals. The thrill and orgasmic catharsis of a good old scream or yell does not reveal the secrets and wisdom that pause when trained men and women assemble to quietly think and talk. It is important to reflect the angst of ordinary folks. It gives them relief, temporary relief only. But having completed that, Policy makers must now ask, what is the problem and how may we help? This is what the chamber is about, to help solve problems in the mobile industry by working hand in hand with everyone who's got a piece of the puzzle in their hand so that those who took a risk with their money have something to show for it whilst growing our economy, empowering our people, and impacting their lives. I thank you. Thank you very much, Keku Sechi Ado, the Chief Executive Officer of the telecoms chamber you have indeed earned your position the telecommunications company must be very happy with you how many of us are not curious i am definitely curious at this time to hear a response from the government 